Okay, um, it's on, yep. Welcome to the KVM Forum uh, panel discussion. Um, this is, um, we have a whole bunch of panelists here and remotely Susie will join. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it in person. So she is uh, joining us uh, via Zoom. Uh, I hope you're able to hear us, Susie. Yeah, I can hear you well. Excellent. Um, okay, uh, so my name is Kashyap Chamarasi and I work uh, in Red Hat's cloud engineering team. And um, I'll let the first panelists introduce themselves. Susie, you wanna go first? Oh, sure. Yeah, so uh, I'm from Intel. So a junior manager of my team is working on enable Intel features in Linux for both bare metal and virtualization. So sorry that I cannot attend in person due to the travel restrictions. My name is Paolo Bontini and uh, I work at Ad Hat and I'm the maintainer for KVM. I'm Christopher Patel, I do system architecture at ARM. Uh, Sean Christopherson, I'm at Google Cloud and KVM x86. I'm Will Deacon, I'm working at Google, uh, mainly on protected KVM, uh, and I maintain the Arch ARM64 architecture, but not the KVM bits. That's done by Mark, <laughs> wherever he is. There. <laughs> okay, um, I'll kick off with uh, something that has been partly the theme of this KVM forum. So traditionally, virtualization has been used for isolation, partitioning, scaling, and so on. But uh, one of the new things is using virtualization for security. Um, and Microsoft has this virtualization-based security VBS and Samsung has its Knox. What is uh, Linux and KVM up to in this space? Should I start? Chris? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> anybody can, not everybody has to answer on everything. But, yeah, um, um, uh, yeah I mean, uh, one of the both good and bad things of, of Linux is that the maintainer community is uh, very varied. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, have different opinions on like virtualization based security and uh, on how, um, how to implement this kind of, of isolation features. And I think this is one case in which it's really hard to, to get people on the same page. Uh, but I mean, I certainly believe that uh, there is value in uh, in using uh, virtualization for security, and uh, even without something like VBS in in Windows, the the PKVM work, for example, is certainly on on the same uh, uh, idea of having a, an isolating hypervisor and not just a hypervisor providing the service to user space. So I'm. It was very interesting to see PKVM being developed and uh, actually put in use in Android. And my hope is that it kind of be a, it becomes a, a trailblazer for, for other architectures to do the same and uh, that we can have a isolating hypervisor. I don't know if it's the term, but that's what I could there's call actually, it. There's a, it's quite an interesting thing with, with PKVM, which is that uh, Okay, so we have, we have a, a stage two translation for the, for the host and the primary purpose, you saw Quentin's talk earlier on, is so that the, the host can no longer access the guest exactly. memory, right? However, uh, even if you don't have any guests with this stage two, we could potentially, you know, offer hypercalls. So for example, you know, Linux could just say, I want this piece of what it thinks is physical memory to be read only or yeah. non-execute. And you can do that for, you sort of knock out all the aliases at that point, yeah. which is quite nice. Um, we did play around with for example, trying to make the kernel text read only sounds like a really good idea until you hit the static key. And the first thing the kernel tries to do is patch its own text. You think, oh no. <laughs> so it's, it's um, you know, there's some nice ideas there, but making them practical for, for actually being yeah. able to use by Linux is, is somewhat challenging. Yeah, I guess we've been a bit spoiled in, in Linux uh, because compared to, to Microsoft, they've always had problems with uh, programs that patch the heck out of kernel space. They wanted really to prohibit that while in Linux, it's the opposite. Like we, we patch things uh, as we see fit for mm -hmm. performance. Or, so Microsoft already had, a, a, had had been doing the same things badly with like observing if there were any changes and crashing the system uh, hope, mercilessly if it happens. Mm -hmm. So they could do it f well with virtualization. In Linux, the trade-offs traditionally have been different. So again, it's very different uh, history of the systems and, and you see very different trade-offs and it's difficult to mm, go to change your direction and steer back to, towards some, something like what Microsoft has been doing for, with virtualization-based security. It's, 
I, I don't want this panel to be about praising Microsoft, but still, you, you have to be, give credit when credit is due. <laughs> but I think that, that one of the, uh, PKVM is one of the first steps towards potentially start applying virtualization for security. And I think yeah. that it's interesting, to, it's going to be interesting to observe over a long time. Mm -hmm. Is there room for standardization there or will it effectively be completely locked in that you run Windows and Hyper-V and you run Linux and KVM and they don't work across each other, you can't migrate them uh, unless you introduce nested virtualization or, or will be sort of standardized around common principles. I think there's room for, for doing that standardization but not necessarily good bodies of doing that. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things I think be interesting to observe how that will go. Okay, um, next, somewhat related, uh, thank you, is that um, KVM over time has gained a lot of um, support for a lot of virtualization extensions in x86 and ARM. Um, we have Susie and um, ARM and x86 people here. What has been your experience and challenges? Um, what, what, what works well that goes unnoticed or what, what, what's, what are still the pain points? I know it's a bit of a broad question. Sean, in his keynote earlier in the morning, uh, morning he, <coughs> Um, I'd line some, but maybe not everybody attended that, so. Are we limiting pain points to technical stuff or non-technical stuff? Um, both. <laughs> you tell well, us. I mean, I think we kind of beat the dead horse already for the non-technical stuff. I, I can add something to that. Go for actually. it. So I think, so you know, I, I used to maintain uh, with Mark uh, KVM ARM64, right? And, and eventually for me, I, I not, not actually burned out, but I just, I had enough of, of that work. And it wasn't actually the maintainer work that, that just struck me when, we were talking, when you were talking this morning that, it was simply the amount of reviews where had I had more time to structure CI loops or set up things or initiate testing structures, I would have still found that interesting and would have maybe stayed. But I think, they, I think we're conflating having to uh, review all patches and being the maintainer at the same time. And I think if maintainers had the opportunity of saying, I'd like to take your patches, but unfortunately they're not reviewed, nor do I have time to review, I think that that, that might be a way for, for actually uh, making maintainers' life a little bit happier. But again, it's, those rules are not written down anywhere. It's a bit, yeah. Uh, I think with reviews specifically, even if you have them written down, and even if you have the manpower to throw at it, it's a balance. Because if you just have a bunch of reviewers and they have different voices and different opinions, then inevitably you're gonna get a case where it comes down and the maintainer's like, what is this? This is terrible. And it's like, well, this reviewer told me to do it this way. And so it's, if you have too many voices, too many cooks in the kitchen, then you're gonna have a mess. So there's a balance there. But I agree, like, it's not feasible to scale and have one person be the Well, the having too effort. many reviewers was never our problem, but. <laughs> I, know, I mean, again, it would be a wonderful problem to have, but. Um, I mean, with the, with the, you just have to look at the list, the KVM arm list, right? And uh, there are a lot of patches. I think poor Mark, again, he's on the receiving end of all of that. But if you look at them, people might think, okay, well, it's probably just bringing up parity with, with x86. And okay, some of it is, but most of it is architecture extensions, mm -hmm. new CPU features, errata workarounds, that kind of stuff. And they're quite hard to review. Uh, I mean, honestly, Mark, I keep pointing at him, but he is the best person to review. He, there are some people mm -hmm. who are getting up to speed with it, but there's an awful lot of pre like, prerequisite knowledge for somebody to give a meaningful review on that code. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for me, that one point that is uh, n not maybe surprising if you don't know the the way that KVM development works, but something that Sean bring, brought up was uh, that the good enough mentality, because uh, the good enough mentality becomes technical debt sooner or later. Like as you enable more and more uh, hardware features, uh, at some point maybe the hardware starts doing things that you did well enough before and now you have to basically make sure that the sometimes maybe even you can migrate from for a machine that accelerates it in hardware to a machine that doesn't accelerate in hardware so you have different states uh, from the old emulation and the new one and uh, if you improve the, the implementation you have to be able to migrate from the old implementation to the new one and again different state so uh, that's one thing that probably wasn't realized uh, uh, at the time, we got sort of lucky f with nested virtualization because it didn't support migration for a long time. But uh, as we get more, uh, uh, not just new features, but also acceleration, hardware acceleration of existing features, you find out that some choices that you made 10 years ago become like an absolute pain point. 
Susie, you want yeah, to say anything? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, my team has been working in uh, KVM community for 15 plus years. Uh, I think we are being uh, very happy with uh, our experience uh, working with the KVM community. So, uh, you know, this is very effective for the healthy community. We see a lot of uh, active contributions, uh, not only from people on hey, this I need to enable this my comfort features, but also, you know, I think quite some people actually have a critical core sense of ownership. Uh, this is my, my project. I want to uh, make it better, right? Uh, for example, um, contributing to the infrastructure, contributing to the uh, bug fixing, etc. Um, and also, I think on the maintainer side, the patch actually open. Uh, I mean, it's reviewed in time, and the open time, the maintainer will give us the uh, very specific feedback on um, hey, how to make it better. You know, not just hey, this is a patch implementation, but how specific feedback how to make it better. I often hear from our engineers. Um, uh, they feel this is a very uh, beneficial for their technical capability uh, roles uh, because they can. Uh, learn that from this contribution and the new experience. So I think that's a very important part. Uh, looking forward, I think the challenge, uh, one of the challenges in the past, a lot of the contribution is limited in the KVN and the human space, but with the feature become more and more complex, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, we will need to touch, uh, in, you know, many other KV uh, kernel subsystems, right? So, uh, I think it's important to take a end-to-end uh, view -end there. You know, that's, uh, for example, in how we uh, leverage other kernel subsystem infrastructures and how we will design a feature, how we take the both the bare metal and virtualization into consideration at the beginning. So we don't virtualize does not become a, you know, second thought. Um, so all these things, I think that's, uh, you know, some of uh, the new uh, challenges uh, we're seeing. And definitely we're working with the community towards that direction. Thank you. So um, a related question is um, confidential virtualization is, is a big, big theme. And yesterday's KVM forum, most of the sessions were related to those themes. So um, it's, it's a red hot topic and a lot of challenges. Each vendor and each architecture has their own challenges. What, what are some of the areas where vendors can work together on, on this? Um, I have one potential thing that I see here is that attestation is, is the remote attestation is one of the common challenges and that the concept has been around for a while. Every vendor seems to implement their own mechanism in XADX world. Um, how is that with ARM? I mean, this is one example. But. I want to pass on attestation. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. There's a talk. Right? There's a talk, There's a talk right after, after, after this about you, you exactly this topic. Yeah, I was supposed to mention that. I, I planned the fifth attestation. <laughs> 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 no, yeah, I mean, uh, the, really, it, it's it's very hard for uh, because it's you you see software people that are. That I have to deal with with hardware people doing software, and uh, like in, in the interaction is is, is complicated. It's uh, th there's many different approaches depending on who your customers are. Of course, S390, where you have uh, one machine is your data center. It's, you just make the machine bigger. Is very different from x86 when where you have more horizontal scaling, and uh, yeah, it's. I'm not sure, I, I don't want to say that it's impossible, but you can see that it's really challenging to, to find an approach that fits for all. At least what we can do is trying to focus on similar interfaces. Uh, the implementation may not be the same, but uh, like, like another point from, from Sean's talk today, not, not coincidentally. Like the more you make things similar to to what already exists in, in hardware, for example, the more you can rely on existing uh, documentation and uh, and knowledge. And this is a design point has been a design point uh, uh, for for KVM since forever. Sometimes we maybe took it even too far, like with secure boot and, uh, and system management mode, but still. It's, it's been a design point to try not to invent things. And uh, I personally think that sometimes hardware vendors should resist the urge to invent things. 
uh, a little bit uh, because uh, otherwise you get into the situation where you have uh, 14 standards, uh, no one fits your use case, so you invent the 15. <laughs> And I think the, the way I would phrase it is I really want hardware vendors to give us building blocks so that software people can go take things and build things that fit their needs instead of companies saying, here's our solution. We've built the whole thing for you. Now can you use it? Like that's, it's just, it's very hard to adapt. It's very inflexible when we want to change it. And like PKVM, I'm an x86 person, but I love the PKVM thing. Like, it is just fantastic. <laughs> like, you get to do everything in open source. Is, is that it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, it's, I, it's wonderful. Um, I mean, I wish that we got to do that on the x86 side and go write the whole thing in software and just have the building blocks that were provided by hardware to do that. And I think that gets you a lot of things, like standards. Like, we have a way of doing this in Linux, and it works across everybody. We hide a little bit of that in the low-level software because hardware is slightly different, but only in the building blocks. And what gets seen at the end level is what's supported in Linux, not what's supported on Intel, AMD, ARM, and 50 other vendors. But speaking of that, there is, uh, nothing is preventing you from having PKVM on x86 as well, I guess. There was a proposal there someone was a talk, right? <laughs> mentioned yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yesterday or the day before. So you can have it on x86 too. <laughs> we could have pieces of it on x86, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, there's trade-offs, you could do it. I think that the interesting though, back to mentioned attestation, I mean, that's got a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, and it's, it's not just hardware, it's not just architecture, it's things like you know, the way that you boot the machine, which I know with, with x86 might be one true way, but like on ARM, there's quite a few different ways of doing that. So I, mean, we, I remember the ACPI wars <laughs> not too long ago where we, we introduced ACPI support on ARM64. Um, but it, it kind of, it does mean that it's, it's hard to find people to own uh, the whole end-to-end -end attestation story because it's not just in the hands of one person to implement it on ARM64. On ARM we can't just say to ARM, hey, you do this. And they say, well, ah, but we only do the architecture. You need to talk yeah. to these people. And it's, I think that's a, uh, a big challenge to try and get somebody to, to own that problem, but also someone that people actually trust. <laughs> but I think it's also, it's, it's also just not a well enough understood problem yes. at this point in time. So you know, the standards are going to come out. The, the use of TDX and PKBM, ARM CCA eventually is going to come out and being actually used. And we'll see, and we'll see where we can, you know, if we can just share plumbing or if we can share principles or standards or wherever it gets us. But I think mm -hmm. it's going to have to be a bit of one step at a time, unfortunately. Yeah, so I want to add one example here on how we have elaborated this confidential engineering space. Right? So in the past, um, you know, the, the guest trust the, the, you know, the host and the advisor, uh, but uh, now that's in the confidential community, that's uh, the host OS and the advisor is no longer in the PCB, right? So this is a new trend model of basically, hey, the guest we need to, um, we need a hardened guest to, against this the host and the hypervisor attacks there. Um, you know, for example, the guest host, they've been shared some, you know, that's a shared buffer on some I overtization, how we make sure the host input is not, you know, there's, there's some issue and trying to attack the guest, uh, uh, you know, confidential secret data from there. So this need to be a lot of, um, you know, the guest hardening work, like the auditing, like the, you know, the fuzzing testing. And this is uh, um, not only, you know, in the, for the host, uh, I'm sorry, this is not only for the guest kernel, but for many of the layers in the guest, right? Like, uh, you know, the, the the, the guest firmware, like the, um, the, the guest grub, guest stream. So there's a huge amount of work needed to, uh, guess, uh, to harden the guest software stack against this new thread model. I think that's certainly a lot of things we can collaborate with across the hardware vendors and with the Linux kernel community. With the Linux community. Okay, um, thank you. Um, what else have I got? I forgot to mention in the beginning that um, the Etherpad was supposed to take questions from Etherpad, but it was crashing for me. That's why I had an offline backup and a set of prepared questions. Okay, so next one, um, it's a bit on um, ARM related. So uh, in 2020, uh, you gave a KVM forum talk um, on exposing KVM for Android. And you, you talked about virtualization being the wild west of fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So how do you update that definition in 2022? <laughs> or how do you see that? Uh, I can't extend the analogy on the fly. I'm trying to think what I'd say. We're all on the same horse together, maybe. I don't know. But the, um, I think one of the things that has changed, so it was only you know, a couple of years ago, so it takes a long time to, to change this kind of stuff. Um, but one thing that has changed is that we're, we're now, as, as Android, engaging more with the, with the silicon vendors, with the OEMs, and 
with the Android virtualization framework, which is the broader project, which PKVM is like the hypervisor part, but obviously there's lots of user space bits and interfaces to, to, to talk to the virtualization services. Um, that, that's provide a focal point. People want to enable this on their SOCs, so we're now being able to actually find, okay, so what are you doing in your hypervisor today? Um, how much of that do we need to support in PKVM? How much of that could we move to somewhere else? And that, that kind of stuff. So I, I think we'll get there, um, it, but it is still quite fragmented. It's just, I guess we're working on it. And uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Chris, you have a different? We're, we're definitely seeing that, that the, mm -hmm. the, basically the, the, the steps you've taken with PKVM is also pushing uh, things all the way back to like SOC designs where they're, they're starting to think about, okay, so virtualization is a thing for, uh, for security in this space and we need to start thinking about how we actually design chip that's coming three, five, seven years down the road uh, to, to cater for this and, and that, that's an amazing feat. Yeah. Okay. Um, a related one while we're still on ARM and unrelated to this. Um, again, uh, in, in that talk that you mentioned that there is uh, 2020 talk on exposing Kevin by Android. There's a lot of third-party um, code that is running at a highly privileged exception level in um, yep. architecture. So you said that needs to be deprivileged using KVM. Um, and how's that effort going along? Is that <laughs> yeah, how, how ambitious and naive I was in 2020. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it's definitely the goal, right? So with the, with the parking KVM for a second, right? Um, on an ARM SOC, an Android SOC, you have Trust Zone and you have the secure world where there's an awful lot of um, third-party code that, as you mentioned, has, has uh, an elevated level of privilege. And you know, it, maybe that's not the worst thing in the world, but the problem is that's hard to update. That's you want to give examples of this third-party code? Um, well, things like uh, DRM runs over there quite a lot of the time. Um, key management, although maybe that's the right place for key management. Yeah. Key um, management is Batman. Yeah, <laughs> but just some examples of things that run over there. Um, so was like, yeah, so updating that software, particularly when it gets big and complicated, is a challenge. And moving that to VMs um, would potentially offer a way to update it more easily in the field. Uh, and secondly, it would allow us to provide uh, some level of portability um, because we have a, you know, a virtual platform, a virtual machine. If we can standardize what that VM environment looks like, then you might not have to integrate and develop this code on a per SOC basis or at least be easier to port. So I think there's some big advantages there. Um, the momentum is, is quite quite slow. I mean, we, we have shipped, we are shipping the PKVM and Android uh, 13, that's the, this year's release of Android, and we are using it for um, running parts of actually the Android runtime compiler. Um, but we're not currently running any uh, stuff that we've moved out of Trust Zone. And part of the reason for that is that uh, Trust Zone has been around for quite a long time. It's seen quite a lot of adoption in the hardware. And you can't just move those things over. Right? If, if, if the piece of hardware you need to talk to is glued off on the secure side, well, Okay, it's going to stay. So this, I think we'll get there, um, but it's, it's going to take a little while. But that is one of the things that the ARM confidential computer architecture is trying to address. And again, that's a very okay. like, long, -term, long -term, thing. term thing, but it is a separate world that doesn't trust uh, Trust Zone, nor does Trust Zone have to trust it. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that is one of the, the potential gains over, over a PKVM approach. But yeah, again, adoption will take time. Okay. Um, any other comments? I think. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what else have I got here? Okay, one last uh, on, on sort of ARM64, and because I have two of them. Um, God, you're sure to get an easy ride here. <laughs> <laughs> Learning last time. It's, um, <laughs> so, um, the <laughs> KVM's ARM64 port uh, is being used for um, small form factor devices and uh, larger ones in the cloud server and the phones. H how is the KVM community and, and um, the, the developer community dealing with that diversity. Yeah, it's, um, do you want to take a question or do you want me to go? No, no. Yeah. I think it helps when like 75% of the people involved are employed by one employer, Google. <laughs> so like, it, seriously, it, it eliminates a lot of friction because you have people and you can go, hey, you want to hop on a chat and we'll figure hash this out. When you have people that are spread across geographically and well, different I companies. I disagree actually, are. in the sense that uh, like, I said the bad things about Linux in the beginning, but now I can say the good things. I think the idea of having a single operating system running from uh, uh, machines with like 16 megabytes of RAM up to machines with 16 terabytes of RAM is kind of un unheard of. So, and if there's one thing that Linux has been doing very well uh, uh, is, has been to be able to scale across different use cases. And personally, I find it, uh, maybe not natural, 
but uh, I would be surprised if it wasn't the case. Like that, that KVM would need the two different hypervisors uh, for PKVM uh, and, uh, and for uh, data center use. I mean, you hear that said, that said, uh, it, it's always uh, good. Uh, the part that is more surprising is that the maintainers could pull it off. Like, because PKVM is a very different use case. And the, the many times with, with Linux, the obstacles are more of a non-technical nature. So I'm totally not surprised that uh, the same hypervisor can work from phones to data centers. But still, I think uh, they you guys still did a great job because uh, there's hurdles to, to cross and uh, you did it, so. I mean, you do hear people say, um, you know, today's phone is yesterday's server. <laughs> and I think in, in terms of CPU and memory, that might be true. Um, but I think when you start to get down into the, the deep, dark areas of things like IO topology, uh, it's really not the case, right? So, um, but yeah, although it's not surprising that we, I mean, we managed to sort of support all this array of devices, I think the bit where it, it perhaps is more challenging is around, you know, getting, for example, VFIO, right? If we want to do device pass-through on a server part, okay, it's all PCI, it's all coherent, jobs are good, and it's, yeah. it's just plumbing. Uh, to do that on a mobile device, like you, you might not have translating IMMUs. Yeah, so but just like I mean, <coughs> tomorrow's phones will be more likely to have an SMMU compared to today's. So we're closer. getting there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, at the point where you start to import half of Linux into your protected layer of PKVM to make things work, <laughs> the whole idea kind of falls apart, yes. right? Yes. And I think that that is going to be a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, a complete change of scenery. Um, do you see Rust language being used in the KVM kernel module itself? Um, if so, why? Uh, if not, why not? Uh, and if yes, which areas? Well, I think Susie should start uh, talking about Rust user in user space and the wheel about cross VM as well, and then we can back to the question if you agree. Yeah, I'm not a uh, personal Rust expert, right? But I do see, I mean, especially on the kernel space, but we do see uh, Rust provides a lot of, uh, you know, the uh, security and advantages. So there are uh, many activities in the, you know, the user space uh, to use, uh, you know, the Rust to provide a more uh, security-oriented uh, the user space DMN. I, I think you are all aware of the, you know, for example, the cloud advisor, uh, Cross VM, you know, the firecracker. Yeah, there's a lot of activity in that space. Do you want to talk about Cross VM? So, because yeah, we're using Rust quite a lot actually in, in the AVF project, <laughs> not not in the hypervisor part, because reviewer shortage. That's one way to make that even worse, right? But in the um, yeah, so Cross VM we're using as our VMM. That's that's written in Rust, and we're also currently looking at using Rust for the uh, the first stage bootloader of the guest, and that's quite exciting because. Uh, we managed to get some really good performance by entering the guest with its MMU enabled. Uh, and this Rust code, we, we, we built a crate for basically in building page tables. So it's, it's cool that you can do such low level things. You, th you might think, oh, you have to do the uh, early page table management in assembly code because it's always been done that way. But actually, we have, we have a crate for that now. So and we can initialize the page tables, enter the uh, guest with the MMU on. It means we don't have to do cache maintenance and it's, it's really blindingly fast. So um, I, I see plenty of scope for Rust there. Uh, the original question, I think, was seeing Rust in the hypervisor itself. Um, no, no, I never say never, but uh, it's, <laughs> I think it's going to be think, some friction against that. There's friction, but I think also part of it is you have a working system today. If you want to replace that with Rust, you have to take everything you've written C and throw it away and replace mm -hmm. it with Rust. And that is both technically challenging and can be very politically challenging within a company to say, hey, I want a bunch of engineers to go work on Rust and do this thing that we already have, but it's in C. And so when you have something smaller and more contained like the bootloader code in your guest, that's a very consumable piece. You can go actually do that and not take four years to deliver it. Um, versus if you want to say, go do KVM's x86 emulator in Rust, like why first <laughs> off and second off like good luck actually doing that in any reasonable time frame and having something that comes up to where we're at today so you so. could apply a lot of other techniques in those four years to make the c code better as well mm -hmm. yeah. or, or rewriting to user space <laughs> yeah. or just like uh, i think one possible way to use rust in like for things that kvm does 
is to move them to user space and use Rust in user space. Like you have to rewrite it anyway, might as well rewrite it in Rust, and you get extra advantages for doing less things in the in the kernel, fewer things in the kernel. I think Christopher, your, your point is actually very interesting. So the the idea of um, doing something else in that time, which mm. you could use to benefit the code, <laughs> we've uh, had a. Uh, relationship with some universities looking at the PKVM hypervisor code and they've done something kind of similar and right? they've, they've been looking at the C code and then trying to annotate the sort of ownership types on top of it and then reason about um, the lifetime of objects and that, that kind of stuff and yeah. see if they can find so I think the real them. question is why didn't you write PKVM in Rust? Because <laughs> <laughs> we needed to do it quickly. <laughs> None of us knew it. <laughs> There was a related question on the panel. You see that um, it's from uh, S. Rutherford. Could we rewrite the x86 instruction emulator in something safe? I mean, uh, even though like um, writing an x86 in, in the coder is not probably on, on the top list of things that people want to do, uh, I guess rewriting the x86 emulator in Rust is probably the lowest hanging for it in all of KVM, the question is if you if it's really time well spent. But for sure, it's the lowest hanging fruit. That's what I can say, I guess. I think it's you could do it. But again, do you want to spend the time to do it? And if you have to assign three engineers for two years to get it done, what would you rather? You know, you could take those three engineers and do something else. Probably not worth it. I mean, a lot of it is just tables. Uh, there's not that much code in the x86 emulator. In terms of lines. Of in terms, terms of in lines. In terms of what it does and what it has yeah, to do, yeah. there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of like complexity in like paths that can be followed and therefore bugs that can be introduced unwittingly. So, yeah. But we've had bugs in, in the emulator, so... Like, not bugs, logic are, are bugs, I mean... the obvious today? No, 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 I don't mean logic <laughs> bugs. I mean bugs uh, of the kind that, uh, that Rust and friends are meant to prevent. Right. So there would be some benefit. The question again is whether the, the benefit outweighs the cost, of course. Okay, I think we've got five minutes left, and I've got one loaded question that will probably take up all five minutes. Um, so this is um, mostly an old, age-old debate, um, the idea of standalone hypervisors versus hosted hypervisors, or to use the um, inflammatory terms, type 1 versus type 2 <laughs> hypervisors. <laughs> so how relevant do you think is that, is that <laughs> today, um, uh, and, and we know KVM is neither, and how, what do you think are the pros and cons of KVM here? And uh, yeah, thoughts on this debate, is it relevant at all? I don't think it's relevant at all. Okay. Um, the whole type one versus type two is, I think it's pointless to differentiate there. You can make type one hypervisors out of KVM. PKVM is, for all intents and purposes, a type one hypervisor. Probably looks a lot like what early days of Hyper-V or Zen look like. You can make x86 KVM a type one hypervisor if you want to. It's all about what you want to do. If you want to take KVM in a direction of security and whatnot, you go PKVM. But the benefits of type two, KVM, are that you get all the goodies from the Linux kernel, memory management, scheduling, and all that stuff. So it's just about, I think differentiating type one versus type two is just pointless. I've, I've been, asked on, been asked on a few occasions, right, with PKVM, is it type one or type two? Oh, it's type one and a half. And yeah, they just walk <laughs> off and they, go, they just left like this. I usually say it is type two with benefits. <laughs> 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 but actually, when I had that, that discussion with Avi when I was submitting the, the KVM ARM patches, uh, I remember him saying that the, the MMU notifiers was really the, the thing that made KVM not quite a type two in his mm -hmm. view, right? Because okay. Linux really does things for the hypervisor, and that, that, that's a big difference from, like, the, I think the type two was intended to say when you had to, like, install something that looked like a driver in Windows and make it behave as if it was running virtual machines, being a workstation mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. 1999 or whatever that was. And um, uh, yeah, I think that is that is true. That it, it's 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 that co that, that they collaborate is, is the, the real yeah, difference. And, that matters. and even if you look at the Type Two hypervisor, there are such diverse uh, designs, uh, like starting from VMware Workstation, where it's like a completely separate driver that just happens to run in kernel space, to Apple hypervisor framework, which is as limited as possible and uh, a lot of the code that would uh, run in KVM or in VMware workstation actually is moved to user space. KVM uh, has uh, lots more help from, from the kernel in terms of, for example, uh, context switching and so on. So 
there's so many ways to do a hypervisor, whether type one or type two, that uh, it, it, in, it's not even a, 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 a single variable. Like you, you can probably find m three different axes of how to design a hypervisor. It does demonstrate quite nicely how we're useless at naming things, though, right? <laughs> type one, type two, and then you look at what we have on, on ARM64, and we have VHE and NVHE as well, and it's just the naming soup. <laughs> But it's a good archaeological exercise to try and find the root, the actual definition of type one and type two. I think it's right. a scanned PDF that you can't search. Uh, really? for Popex Gold, uh, Popex or Goldberg's thesis from '72. Mm -hmm. so, yes, yes, I recommend finding it. It's, it's fun. <laughs> I think the easiest way to find it is to find the KV, so to search in the KVM mailing list because sooner or later somebody posted the link. It might or might not be dead, <laughs> but uh, it's probably a good way to start with something because I think that. It, the, the whole type one, type two was misused for 15 years of life of KVM, basically. Susie? Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I think this is a kind of a too old kind of terminology. It's not that you know, uh, relevant. To me, I think the most uh, important thing is what kind of the hypervisor feature are you looking for you know, for your use case, right? So, for example, if you are, you know, uh, is this, uh, for example, requires a super light uh, hypervisor? Uh, and are you requiring kind of function safety, real time? And for this one things, we can discuss uh, is that relevant to have, uh, you know, do you need to really see hypervisor to do this kind of things, or you need to have a, uh, in the OS part of the hypervisor to provide uh, all the uh, other benefits? So, I mean, it's not really a technology, it's really driven by a feature definition, feature requirements. Okay, um, we're just one minute short. Um, any closing thoughts in 10 seconds each? <laughs> Heavy maintenance, um, now that you have two x86 extra maintainers, what are you going to do with all that extra free time? Uh, <laughs> You're implying <laughs> that all Apollo's time was going to KVM x86, and that was the problem, is it wasn't. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I don't know, but uh, there are certainly things to fix uh, that are uh, not kernel code. So my hope is to be, a, I think, without being too immodest. I was overall pr doing pretty well in the personal relations with the developers. Uh, other people were actually doing better than me in the code review. Like I'm not very good at code review myself. I, I have other things that I'm better at doing. But uh, I, I think w where I want to go is uh, not because I have extra free time, but because it's needed is basically to, to remove the hurdles to contribution and uh, to like have a, a better way to, to onboard new people. And an important thing that should be done is to do that across other kernel subsystems. I know, for example, the XFS developers work in a very similar way to KVM developers. They probably don't know it uh, because I also don't know very much the details. But if we do these things like find documentation, onboarding documentation, sharing skits, uh, it should be done not, not only for KVM. Okay, we're um, one minute over. Um, we're, that's all we have here. Uh, thank you for um, the discussion and thanks for attending everybody. That's all we have here. Yeah. Wow.